I'm really excited to look closer into this one's face. There we go. Look at that beauty. But you all see where the red boxes that said white balance, you can actually see these little dots here. Those little dots are the omatidia or the eye cells. We can even see on that res right here. If we get on top of her head, like further down, there's going to be additional cells called um, the ocelli. So there's a false eyes that they're called. They detect UV light and give the animal their sense of direction. Um, these aren't them. This is just some kind of coloring that we've got here. Not a great view of the stinger before we get, you know, start moving her around. I'll probably just pop the abdomen off for us to get a closer look at the stinger. Uh, the legs covering. Oh, no, you can kind of see it. There is the stinger, y'all. The painful part isn't the, the, the needle because it's almost like a hypodermic needle. It's the venom that goes in because there's different wasp species that do different have different flavors of venom. Some of the venoms cause there to be cell death. Others cause there to be immune suppressant, all of that. Now, this has been preserved in alcohol. What will end up happening with that preservation is when we dissect it open, yes, we'll find the venom gland, but that venom is deactivated because of the alcohol. So it's uh, we're, we'll be safe on it, but I'm not going to intentionally like, you know, attempt to sting myself with the uh, with it because that would be, you know, less than optimal. So what we're going to do, we're going to first remove the head. I'm not going to dissect into the head yet. We're just going to pop it off. I want to take a look at the ocelli or those fake eyes. Do you all see the fake eyes? They're right up here. Those three dots. One, two, three. Those are the ocelli or those UV detecting lights. Eye cells. Nub one, nub two, nub three probably going to be probably the best hit of an image that we get. That is a telltale sign of a flying insect. So insects that have a heavy light part of their life cycle, they'll have those three eye, eye cells up top or some variation. There's some that just have like one large one and there's others that have like this cluster of three. Um, yeah, so I think it's really, really cool and nicely visible. I know, Andrea, the hair number. So they're fake, they're called fake eyes because they don't see images, they see UV. So they are more used for orientation of like when you're flying, using the sun to give you act like a, a sense of direction and like where you're flying towards the horizon and like steadying. So they're fake eyes and so much you're not getting an image, but you're still receiving information. And again, it's something that's much more on the flying side of things. If you see a terrestrial insect, it's not really gonna have it. Even ants, like the queen will have the triple, but the workers will have maybe one. And the size of the one that they have is kind of correlated with how long they're outside of the nest. So if they're further outside of the nest for longer, they'll have a bigger one. Um, if they're barely outside of the nest, it'll be a smaller one. So you see, this is the eye and those little circles right here are the ocelli. And so that an o ocelli being plural, um, or sorry, not ocelli, omatidia are here. Omatidium being singular, omatidia being plural. And so those were the original cells discovered that were responsible for vision. And vision in the way of like, an actual image being processed. And then these up at the top of the head do see things, they're just not seeing an image. So when the, the naming system was invented, I think when these were discovered, it was like in the 30s, uh, 1930s, they just called them the fake eyes because of also structure. They kind of looked like an eye, but they weren't actually seeing an image. So that's some of like the historical context for it. The queen ant has that. For the wasps and the hornets, they all have a lot of flight activity. So there it's the workers also have it. Um, so this one, no, this one we can't ID of a queen just off that feature. If it was an ant, then yes, we could be like, that's probably a queen. But this isn't an ant, this is a wasp. So they're the workers also because they fly around so much. They do smell history buff. They have, they, uh, they are their antennae, are their noses. We should actually see in a little bit, I'm um, actually in a second, I'll pop open this one's head and we'll be able to see in the brain where the processing center is for smell. Can you add one? So not 15, not yet. There is no reason why we couldn't be able to do, but it's not as simple as one gene. Like it's easier to break something than it is to fix it. So if you re if you identify a couple of different genetic elements that make these false eyes, if you get rid of that gene, you're probably going to break that false eye, right? And then you can ask the question of what it does that way. Adding it usually will take multiple genes and also because it's a structure 
structure, you have to time it correctly during development. And so figuring out when to add it by turning on it to a certain gene, how much to dose up and like all like all those become variables. And so that makes it, I think, harder than if you had it right where it was just breaking. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Not all right. Are y'all ready? Should we pop open this head and see some brains? And I'll try to get it in focus and pause where I can. Just remember, this is my first wasp head dissection. So the procedure isn't going to be any different from when we've done an ant brain or a fruit fly brain. It's just knowing how hard the exoskeleton is that I have to be careful about. Because you can imagine a situation if I pull too hard, it's just going to rip the brain. Look at that. <laughs> there is what I am convinced is the first ever wasp brain dissected on Twitch.tv. You might be like, Blint, how on earth? You've never dissected one before. How on earth do you know that this is the brain? So when you're dissecting an insect head, the brain opacity so how see-through it is is pretty consistent between different species so it's not really clear tissue and it's not really like like that's what ends up it, it's kind of this like you know the nice glass that you have in showers that doesn't if you have a glass door in your shower and it's not clear glass so you can see through it but then it's it's more like a that pattern glass so you can you can kind of see through but you can't really make out any detail exactly sam it's that translucency of it so that's a little bit of what we're seeing here now i will say i did not nail this dissection and the reason we got the central brain the central brain we got perfect the optic lobes i ripped off and by blunt why on earth did you rip off the optic lobes that's so uncool of you man you're right so to orient yourself in this brain the top of the head would be here. The mouth is here. And then the eyes right here and here. And actually, you can kind of make out there's an optic lobe right there. The bit bit of it here. In fat, so Della, that's what that's why it's this opaque is because there are fat cells here. Are, are the two sticky thingy bits on top are the antennae? So that is so actually, that's a great question, Glute. This is reversed. So that these two structures that you see here and here are support tissues and they're at the back of the head. So we actually would flip this specimen to have it right side up so you could you could see what the face sees. Does that make sense, Glute? So it's just upside down. And those are typical support structures that are inside the head of insects. Uh, that's also in um, in fruit flies as well. Uh, let me try to flip it around. There we go. That's the right side up. So, I, so the actual, the antenna lobes, uh, I can show you now, Glued. This here and this, do you see those two circles? It's almost, it's also symmetrical now, right? So I've, I've aligned it in a way where this is the top of the head. That's the bottom where the mouth is. And then these are the antenna lobes. So that's where the antenna connect to. And you can see, again, if we cut right down the center, it's a mirror image on either side, which I think is really, really cool. Um, so you can see a, a vast level of detail. And don't worry, we'll open up the other one too. Glued said that some of the specimens were already dead before she put them into the vial. Why that's important is because that means that some of them will have started to degrade and decay before she preserved them. So when we're opening up the heads, there could be some that when we open up, fall apart really, really rapidly or not all there. And that's not just because I did a bad job dissecting, but it could be because they just had already broken apart. Hopefully that makes sense. Absolutely. So Morris, what's really cool is if you look at the brain of an insect, you can de detect what its primary sense is that it uses to get around in the world. And by that, I mean, is it smell, right? These antenna lobes are huge. So it's probably got a lot of smell to do it too. The optic lobes here, right, like I said, are not a good indicator because I ripped them. But if you were to see the optic lobe and you see a large optic lobe, you could be like, all right, there's a lot of visual information that this animal is going to be processing. Versus if you have really, really small optic lobes, then there's far, far less in terms of visual system that it's re relying on, which I think is, again, really cool. One zone that's commonly gigantified in social insects is the mushroom body that's the learning and memory center of the brain. And so up here, that's where that'd be located. Those little wiggly bits are the insect uh, tongue. Twisted tongue! You will not let me! What is this? Fire! Fire! So what I'm just doing now, y'all, is 
peeling away the exoskeleton. And I just want to show you all something. So a couple of things here, chat. This brain has started to decay. So this was put into alcohol after it had died. So I just took off the exoskeleton here. That's all I did. And you see how it's already kind of coming apart? It's probably going to be breaking up. So when we pop this out, I don't think it's going to come in a solid piece. But I wanted to show you all because right here, do you all see that kind of near see-through tissue? That's the optic lobe. That is all touching the retina. That is all eye tissue right there. Because I noticed that it was kind of breaking apart, um, I was able to, to account for that when doing the dissection. The brown is some necrosis glued. So it's like cell death before it was actually preserved. It's also fluffier, which is another element of like that it had already gone beforehand. It's less see-through because some of those cells started dying and it wasn't as well preserved. When I first started doing fruit fly dissections, I learned on what are, say, not valuable samples in that they weren't the experimentals. They were just fruit flies that were going to go in the trash anyway. Here you go, practice getting, doing brain dissections. Now, it turns out, Andrew, that even if you get really good at those, there's all these extra variables that you can't account for. Um, and by one of those age, so it turns out that older fruit flies have stickier brains. By sticky, I mean when you're ripping off the exoskeleton, they just stick better. So if you aren't careful with the exoskeleton tear, you will rip apart the brain. And there, like, you can't sequence that anymore because you've just shredded it. And that is, like, when you've been aging a, an animal for 65 days and then you just pop it and it just, it just, yeah, it's... Yeah, so, Andrew, it's the connective tissue. Like, it's, imagine, because in a fly, right, there's no veins or arteries. There's just... You have to have something holding the brain in place, and that's this connective tissue. Uh, let me show y'all real quick the visual system. Let's zoom in a little bit. So right here, y'all, is the eye. The way that you can tell that's the eye, and we're at max zoom, so we're actually 45 times magnified. That all, see all those little lines? All those little lines are individual neurons that connect to each of those circles that were on the outside of the wasp's head, on the eye. Each of those omatidium, or omatidia plural, had a neuron that was connected to it that went in deeper. It's relaying the visual information into the optic lobe of the brain, which is here. And then a little bit deeper, probably around here is what is called the lobula, where the visual information is processed together. So basically all these images here are unstitched at this point. They're just independent images. And then in the lobula, they're stitched together to make one giant image. And then it goes in further into the brain. That's the process by which something like this happens, which again, I think is pretty cool. All right, guys, let's go look at, look at the abdomen now. Guys, there is the innards <laughs> of a wasp thorax. Do you all see that fluffy bit? So those are uh, muscle tissue. That's muscle, muscle tissue right there. So we popped off the head, that's all I did, and you can see inside of it now. So werewolf, this should give you a, a better image of the muscle. Do you, do you see how it's strips of tissue? So that's what you're seeing here, is just the, that's like strips of muscle. So here is the stinger. It's a wasp stinger for you. So this is really, really empty. I wanna show y'all, this was the only stuff that was inside the abdomen. So glued, there are two things here. So you got a very, very, very hungry wasp. So glued with gold, y'all found this wasp in her house, right glued? Am I correct in that, that they were trying to come in? It is no surprise that this wasp came in because she was starving. There was, there is a fat tissue called the fat body and there is none in this wasp. He was going off energy reserves and like on the hairy edge of life. So that also is why she, like remember the fear response we talked about has been lowered. That's why, because she's so heckin' hungry. Now there's two other things in here. There's this, it's the venom gland. And actually you can see it's empty. She probably stung someone and didn't have the energy to produce more because there's cells, like almost stem cells for the venom that replenish the venom. It's empty. And then these, this is the remainder of the ovary. And the way you can tell is there is this egg here and there is a little sw swoosh coming out. So those are those little hairs are what the eggs breathe through where there's oxygen transmitting between the egg and the the embryo and the outside but it's shriveled so even this egg is like totally wrecked there's like no fat cells in here this animal is totally wrecked uh so yeah this one very hungry uh let's check out the other one that had the 
gigantic abdomen and see what was going on there. If it's like, I mean, honestly, if it, if they're this hungry, it would not surprise me if that was also empty. I'm not sure what these eat, Sam. There's some that are, are meat eaters. There's other ones that are like sugar water. If you wanted to, you could catch it and fatten it back up, but it's probably not going to live much longer. Um, just because they're, again, yearly living. Like, the life cycle is pretty brutal for a wasp. Like, developing over winter, hatching in the spring, starting up a colony. By the time early fall hits, there's winged reproductives that maybe start hatching. And the existing, then they hatch, and then the queen is left alone. She dies, the reproductives have flown off, and the cycle can begin again. So it's uh, a, yeah, it's kind of a one year and done. It's not like the 30 years that we get with the, uh, the ants. I like that. All right, this is the mega one, y'all. So there is stuff in here. Whoop. Before we get a little deeper, I just wanted to show you all this. This is the upper part. That's the upper part of the abdomen. Do y'all see that? That's connective tissue. There's nothing really in there beyond connective tissue, the upper part of the abdomen. So it, it, Casey, it all sunk to the bottom. So Casey, this is the bottom part of the abdomen. Do you see how it's super stuffed? This is because it wasn't preserved right away. And so it's just the connective tissue started to decay and everything just dropped in. Literally the force of gravity coming on in here, which is, you know, it's kind of cool to, to see that going. There we go. So this is the equivalent right here of the fallopian tube and the uterus. So you have this structure here, and you all see it kind of has these tubes that go here. And then you have this structure here, and it has tubes that go here. So it's the equivalent of uh, the fallopian tubes in the uterus. It's not, it, that's not the function that goes on here. Right, so the egg doesn't just like develop all in the uterus. It's a conveyor belt that they have. So you start off with stem cells near the top and they develop and as you move down the chambers, you get bigger and bigger eggs. This one's ovaries are a little bit wrecked um, just simply because glued caught it as an aged animal. But you see this white mass here, this white mass here, those are embryos. Remember how we talked about that the brain is essentially a mirror image, right? One over the other. So this, that white mass here and the white mass there, on either side, that's one mature embryo on either side of this organism. Let me grab if there's anything else in the abdomen. And just so y'all know, we have plenty more, um, thanks to glued, plenty more wasp specimens. So we're not like done and never gonna look at wasps again. Thanks to glued, we've got plenty more samples to do. So I kind of wrecked this as I was trying to just like remove <laughs> the elements of this. But so this glued is actually the venom gland. And what's what I unfortunately ripped, but this here glued, that's where the stinger connects right there. I, I tore it off, but imagine the stinger goes to this. So that's the venom gland. And then it's being shuttled down these tubes to the stinger.